So very good afternoon. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you to this Fiki International Tax Conference. I, I take this opportunity to welcome our panelists, key speakers for this upcoming session, which is a panel discussion on OECD's pillar two, global minimum corporate tax rate and potential impact on developing countries. We are pleased and privileged to have with us Mr. Naveen Agarwal, partner in North India Tax Head, KPMG in India. Mr. Hariharan Gangadharan, tax partner, KPMG in India. Mr. Amit Mishra, Vice President, Direct Taxation, GMR Group. Mr. Harun Qureshi, Vice President, Taxes, Genpact. Mr. Sanjeev Agarwal, Head of Tax, Customs and Export Control for Automotive and Financial Services Business, BMW Group. Mr. Rahul Verma, Tax Head, SIPLA. I now request Mr. Naveen Agarwal, who is the session moderator, to take over the proceedings for this particular session. Thank you. Thank you, Nidhi, and uh, good afternoon, everyone, and a uh, very warm welcome to this panel discussion on Pillar 2 of the OECD Two Pillar Solution uh, on the move towards a global minimum corporate tax rate and the impact that it could have on developing countries uh, like India. Now, objective of this session is really to discuss the impact uh, Pillar 2 will have on, on revenue, on investment, and tax competition. Uh, as a quick introduction, my name is Naveen Agarwal. I'm an international tax partner, and I lead the North India tax practice of KPMG in India. Joining us for this panel is a distinguished uh, group of speakers from the industry tax heads of large global and Indian multinationals. And we're fortunate to have uh, you know, tax heads across sectors ranging from financial services to infrastructure, to professional services, technology related services to automotive. So a very warm welcome to all my fellow panelists. Uh, well, I also have uh, my colleague partner from uh, KPMG, Hariharan Gangadharan, Gangadharan on, on the panel. I'll just take a couple of minutes to introduce everyone on, on the panel. So we've got uh, Mohammed Haroon Qureshi. Mr. Qureshi is an Asia-Pacific tax head of Genpact, a, a global professional services firm. He's a veteran in the world of tax with more than 20 years of rich experience across international tax and transfer, transfer pricing. Uh, welcome, Mr. Qureshi. Uh, we have uh, Sanjeev Agarwal. Sanjeev heads the tax and customs function for the BMW Group in India. Again, has over two decades of experience across industries, across finance, tax, legal, and compliance. Welcome, Sanjeev. We have Rahul Verma. Rahul is a senior director from CIPLA, a leading pharmaceutical company from India with global presence. Rahul brings with him over 20 years of work experience in matters related to direct tax, indirect tax, transfer pricing, and business structuring, again, across uh, varied industries. Uh, welcome, Rahul. And we've got Amit Mishra. Amit has recently joined as a head of direct tax uh, from the GMR Group, a large Indian conglomerate in the infrastructure sector. And, and Amit again comes with extensive experience in direct tax uh, in the consulting world before he joined GMR. Uh, my colleague partner, Hariharan Gangadharan, uh, leads the tax technical practice of KPMG in India. And, and he's been closely tracking the OECD BEPS developments right from the inception. So before we deep dive in, into today's discussion, uh, just to set some context, and uh, maybe I'll request Hari if you could, uh, you know, project the slides. Uh, as, we, as we all see that uh, much of the contemporary debate that we see around us, uh, both globally and in India, has been around uh, the global rules to tax uh, digitalized businesses. And, and that debate kind of started uh, with the OECD BEPS project in 2013. And then in 2015, uh, we we realized that it was not there was no solution in sight, and from there on the pendulum has actually shifted uh, to now, which has evolved as a two pillar solution. And uh, you know, pillar one, which uh, the the previous session was on, uh, was about uh, bringing in new nexus rules and reallocation of taxing rights to in scope companies in market jurisdictions. Uh, and uh, there was a good discussion on that that happened earlier earlier this afternoon. Uh, what we're going to cover is pillar two, which uh, in, in some sense recognizes two challenges. Uh, the first challenge being that despite the initial BEPS project, there is a continued risk of profit shift shifting that's happening to low tax jurisdictions. And the second element is that in the absence of a, a global consensus 
on what should be regarded as a fair level of taxation globally, there is probably a, a risk of unbridled tax competition happening between countries, uh, effectively what is referred to as the race to the bottom. Now, the, uh, in essence, basically what Pillar 2 is, is trying to do is to give a new normal to the effective tax rates uh, that should apply to large multinationals. Uh, and the premise is pretty simple that uh, if a state does not exercise taxing rights to that minimum rate, which is now defined as 15%, then a new network of rules will kick in to reallocate those taxing rights or provide a right to tax back to another state. So effectively, this is a new paradigm of international tax, or shall I say a new playing field, which will become a reality if all goes well in 2023. Uh, it seems to be an ambitious and a tall order, but uh, you know, we've, with the way the developments have taken place, um, at least there seems to be a, a commitment and willingness to make that happen. And, and 2022 being reserved for some additional groundwork. So with this brief context, let me hand over to Hari, uh, my partner, to lay out the foundational aspect of Pillar 2. Hari, over to you. Thank you, Naveen. Uh, as, uh, as Naveen just said, the context, the broad objectives of Pillar 2 are on the one hand to minimize the incentives that exist for large multinational groups to shift their profits to low tax countries. And the other objective, which is more a macro policy level objective, is to try and end harmful tax competition between countries uh, who often find themselves being forced to offer incentives or cut tax rates which they can't afford to do so only in order to attract investments. Now, the way Pillow 2 tries to achieve these objectives is by setting out, as Naveen mentioned, minimum tax rates. Uh, there are two rates of 15% and 9% which apply for two different set of rules that form part of Pillow 2. Now, Pillow 2 does not mandate that all countries should impose taxes that meet this 15% or 9% threshold. But what they instead do is say that if countries choose to not apply taxes at these minimum globally agreed rates, other countries will be allowed to step in and levy a top up tax so that the overall tax cost rises to 15 and 9% respectively. As you can imagine, the rules are complex, they are very detailed. Uh, but what we will do today is talk at a very high level about how these rules work. Uh, our objective is really to focus on when these top-up taxes can be levied, how are these top-up taxes to be calculated, who gets to levy these top-up taxes, and lastly and most importantly, what all of this means from a practical perspective for both Indian inbound as well as Indian outbound structures. Now, the rules themselves are intended to apply only to very large internationally operating businesses. So there is a reference to a 750 million euro group consolidated revenue threshold. Uh, but we do need to keep in mind that the 750 million euro threshold is not uniform across pillar two. Countries have some leeway to lower thresholds for some part of the rules, and that thresholds are not yet finalized for some other parts of the rules. Uh, and, and most importantly, uh, these thresholds, when they do come in as part of the final rules, they are relevant only in so far as the applicability of the pillar two rules are concerned. Now, it's possible that in reaction to the pillar two proposals, we might see countries increase tax rates or newly introduced income tax rates or remove incentives. Now, in those situations, it's possible that these removal of incentives or the increase of tax rates could happen across the board. And if that does happen, we might see that these changes could affect uh, businesses that have a much lower revenue threshold than the 750 million threshold that's talked about as part of the uh, pillar two rules. Mm -hmm. Now, there are four rules that, that make up Pillar 2. Two of them are treaty-based rules, and two of them are rules which countries will end up incorporating into their respective domestic laws. The main treaty-based rule is called the Subject to Tax Rule, or the STTR, which at a very conceptual level imposes a top-up withholding tax or an additional withholding tax on certain specific payments that are made to related parties. If the recipient, the one who receives the payment, is not adequately taxed on those payments in his home country. The second treaty-based rule is called the switchover rule. This is somewhat less relevant from an Indian context, but for the sake of completeness, this changes the exemption method under tax treaties to a credit method in certain situations. There are two rules that are domestic law rules. Uh, they are together called the GLOBE rules. And this is where the global minimum tax rate of 15% that 
we have seen discussed in the media, et cetera, comes into play. The way that these rules work is that first, the country of the ultimate parent entity in the group is allowed to collect a top up. The country of the top -up tax, if its overseas subsidiaries are not adequately taxed on their incomes. Now, the rule that enables the ultimate parent entity's country to collect this tax is called the income inclusion rule or the IIR. If for some reason the IIR is not applied by the ultimate parent entity's country, then we have a backup rule that will kick in and enable this top up tax to be collected by other countries where the group has a presence. This backup rule is called the undertaxed payment rule or the UTPR. And this works by disallowing a deduction for certain related party payments in order to collect the top up tax. Now, this is in a nutshell a very, very high level introduction to the concept of Pillar 2. We will dive into details, but before that, I just want to hand over to Naveen for some initial comments and some reactions from our panelists. All right, thank, thank you, Hari. And, uh, and we will get into a specific discussion on, on these rules as they apply differently to uh, you know, uh, companies which are headquartered outside of India and the Indian headquartered companies. But before that, let me open the, the floor to the panelists um, and, and get some quick reactions. I mean, as tax heads, you would be following these developments quite closely and just wanted to understand what, what are some of the broad reactions that you're seeing um, in your organizations um, uh, and, and some of the boardroom discussions that are happening because it's kind of changing the paradigm of international tax. Uh, what based on first brush of what you see the rules and of course more details will come out. What do you see could be some of the potential areas of concern uh, as the implementation evolves and and the third element which is really around the phased implementation because as we see that not everything is happening at one go. You have the the globe rules which will come out first which are expected uh, anytime this month and then you have the STTR coming in early part of 2022. Given all of that, uh, does 2023 implementation timeline seems too aggressive. I mean, looking at from an organization standpoint, and does it, does it leave you enough time for preparation? So I know I've packed in quite a few questions, but maybe if some quick reactions will help. Uh, Sanjeev, should I open it up for you first? Sure, Naveen, thanks for this. Uh, so let me start with a uh, short comment that India has been participating on the inclusive framework negotiations since inception. And, and it has been uh, uh, periodically engaging in the discussions, has set the benchmarks for further negotiations, etc., for the entire BEPS framework dialogue. And, you know, we all know until a few years back, there was hardly any acceptance of such principles that markets have tried to tax. And, uh, you know, now we see that there's a consensus and a formula agreed for it. And we must congratulate Indian government for their persuasion for this. Uh, we know that India introduced a, a equalization levy in 2016 and later on enhanced its scope in 2020. Uh, so one of the boardrooms, a uh, very clear expectation is that these, uh, these, these uh, regulations should, uh, in these unilateral measures should actually go out, go off uh, uh, and including the significant economic presence uh, post 20, uh, 2013 or uh, 2023 once the measures as defined in pillar one and two are sort of implemented. So, so that's one. And as far as the 2023 20, deadline is concerned, uh, you know, there are clear indications that India is on the way to implement such changes. Uh, this government's outlook has been positioning India specifically, you know, these multilateral conventions quite positive. So to me, it appears that the government will do whatever is needed to adhere to these two plus situation uh, solutions within the time. Uh, all in all, this is a welcome step aiming towards tax certainty and in line with, you know, upgrading international tax systems. Thank, thank you, Sanjeev. Uh, Mr. Qureshi, your thoughts? Yeah, hi. Uh, good morning to all the uh, participants. So I think uh, just to uh, continue what uh, Mr. Agarwal said, uh, I think as far as the global tax structures are concerned, this is really a step in the right direction. Uh, it will provide the level playing field uh, to various countries. Uh, it prevents unhealthy competition. As you said, there is virtually has been a race to the bottom as far as some countries are concerned. It will uh, hopefully rein in some of those practices. It will also benefit the taxpayers, at least in the long run. Uh, maybe not immediately, but at least in the long run, it will provide certainty. Uh, you at least know 
uh, there is a formula uh, based tax that you have to calculate and you know exactly what you have to pay now while those are the uh, very good uh, positive sides of this but i think we should also bear in mind that especially as far as the industry is concerned there is going to be short term pain in the implementation uh, the tax world i think has been is just coming out of several years of implementing beps action plans and there are different action plans that we have been implementing whether it is the cbcr whether it is the ppt uh, the mli all of these projects actually required significant time and cost commitment from the industry a uh, lot of system changes had to be made investments had to be made and now pillar 1 and pillar 2 will basically take that journey forward uh, which is the right thing to do eventually but again let's bear in mind that there will be further investments required by the industry and lot of time commitment by the tax professionals working within the industry and of course there will be increase in tax costs needless to say there will be increase in compliance costs uh i think as far as the global boards are concerned at least so we have been seeing this uh, i think tax is a, now a very important part of globe uh, board discussions whether globally or in india uh whether it is these global initiatives or india may, uh, may be having its own independent initiatives like the poem the gar the digital levies and all of those things and then there are other countries like australia and uk uh, who have gone on their own journey of uh, multinational anti awareness law diverted profits tax and all of those things so i think the global boards have been really monitoring this very closely in the last uh, few years and i think that engagement is going to just continue uh, in in the future as well just on the last point on the whether 2023 i think it is ambitious uh, i am sure the governments will come together to implement it i don't think uh, there is going to be much leeway on that but again as far as the professionals are concerned as far as the industry is concerned it is going to be a challenge i mean certainly i i, I think it is going to be a challenge because 21 has come to an end we are effectively talking of just one more year uh, and then lot of rules will have to come out countries will have to make their own amendments and everything so it is going to be a challenge but i'm sure uh, i'm sure we'll all live up to it right uh, thank you mr kresh I, i think that's that's very valuable in, indeed and let's let's switch gears to from from an outbound perspective from um, maybe rahul if you could come in with your thoughts on this Yeah, interesting thoughts. I think from Mr. Harun and Sanjeev. So, so I would like to add, like uh, you know, uh, you know, as far as the boardroom discussions are concerned, so like uh, tax optimization or maybe cost optimization, tax is one of the costs will always remain an agenda for the board. You know, even if uh, you know the way I look at it as a tax professional, the fifteen percent global tax rate between that's twenty five percent tax rate in India or uh, say twenty one percent tax rate in US. so it is always be exciting even if you know you could leverage uh, you know this uh, global 15% tax rate is still you know you will have some opportunity to kind of optimize uh, your etr globally but having said that uh, you know the this uh, you know, gone were the days for uh, you know any aggressive planning with the baps initiation and everything is you know out of the thing the, everything is like substance based and i learned i think somewhere that there will obviously going to be some kind of substance based carved out in these uh, globe and sctr rules as well so having said so uh, you know while there is going to be a lot of traction which are required from the direct uh, tax law amendment uh, part of it where the government has to do a lot of uh, uh, you know uh, hard work in term of you know getting those uh, domestic law in place uh, and i believe there is going to be some and as of the constitutional law provision as well whether the government has right to levy tax on the income which is accruing in the other part of the world so we this has been a matter of debate uh, quite often so uh, you know i have to see how this discussion emerge when the uh, you know the finance bill comes in besides that uh, you know whether the domestic law would be enough i don't think so there is going to be some kind of a uh, mli kind of document which everyone has to sign based on which this whole scheme has to apply and based on our experience on mli you know it will definitely going to take time and uh, and is going to be you know interesting to see how this thing fold out with all these uh, participants signing on this document and consensus will built up so having said that it's a step in the right direction and it is uh, you know kind of uh, bring down those harmful 
uh, tax practices of uh, you know attracting investment by lowering your tax rate and abusive tax practice. Uh, but yeah, it is going to be interesting to see how this unfolds and in terms of you know legislation and uh, kind of MLA and the framework with which that comes. And uh, we are keeping our uh, you know organization ready to kind of uh, you know keeping our systems uh, uh, you know kind of look forward to making all those segmenters and all that. It's going to be a task, so to say. So that buzzword in terms of uh, the task and kind of bursting for those efforts for the next year has already started. All right, uh, Amit, uh, your comments as well. I think Amit, you're on mute. Am I audible now? Yes, please. Yeah, so good afternoon, everyone. And first of all, I would like to thank uh, Fiki. For organizing this uh, very important, uh, you know, webinar on pillar two and pillar one, which happened a few minutes back, and uh, I, you know, I heard all the panelists, and it was, you know, you have covered uh, most of the, you know, points which Navin has raised. Uh, the only thing which I need have to say here is that, you know, when all these exercises started uh, way back before 2015, uh, you know, everybody was thinking that this all will remain in paper but now it is going to be a reality very soon and that's why we are here to discuss this so one thing one thing is sure that you know there will be an increase in tax flow tax outflow because there will be a base tax rate which everyone has to follow so that uh, that uh, as as you know uh, we discussed that that will be a, a discussion for the boardroom forever the other thing which you know, uh, what Mr. Sanjeev and Mr. Kuresi has said about the overlapping of various provisions, like uh, in order to tackle the digital economy taxation problems and BEPS, a lot of measures has been taken unilaterally as well as uh, by introducing MLI, PPT and other things. And once this pillar 2 comes into picture, for uh, next few years, there will be overlaps and those are obvious. And because of those overlaps, there could be some difficulty in complying with these provisions. But therefore, the expectation is that uh, those overlaps should be considered and should be removed while drafting the final laws by the uh, parent law jurisdiction, maybe Indian government or any other government, or even uh, if MLI kind of a document is going to come, those uh, removal of those overlaps should be considered so that the compliance can be made easy. Thank you, Amit. Uh... So I, I think what, what I'm hearing is that there is a fair degree of optimism, at least from this group, uh, that, you know, we will find a way through in terms of, uh, you know, obviously there will be challenges, there'll be bumps across the way, uh, but multilateral multilateralism is the way to go. Uh, it shifts away from unilateral measures that countries have been taking. Uh, that certainly is, is directionally. And also from, I, I, it does give me confidence or comfort that, you know, all of you are kind of gearing up to, to this, of course, the time that it took to implement BEPS 1 and now what it will take to implement BEPS 2. Obviously, the the, the effect, uh, the, the time that it will take from all of you will be quite significant, but at least we are moving in the right direction. So with that, let's move to the next section. Um, maybe I'll hand it back to Hari to talk you through um, uh, some part of the interlock rules. Uh, and this is more in the context of uh, the related party payments. Hari, over to you. Thanks, Naveen. Uh uh, we, we'll, before we dive into the related party rules, you know, I just want to set out that there are two broad areas where the pillar two rules could have an impact in an Indian context. The first is on related party payments by Indian entities, and this will apply both in an inbound as well as outbound scenario. And the latter is on outbound structures where you have overseas investments by Indian headquartered groups, where you have tax incentives and other benefits that are availed of in overseas jurisdictions. Now, the the first rule that we'll talk about is the STTR, which will affect related party payments made by uh, Indian entities to uh, overseas group entities. Now, the STTR as a rule applies to payments and not net income. And then again, it applies only to certain kinds of payments. There's a list of payments that are covered within the STTR, and that list is on your screen. Uh, but this list is not exhaustive. There is a possibility that other payments, including possibly even capital gains, could get included within this list, but we know that for sure only once the final STTR rules come in next year. Uh, I think most of these uh, payments are familiar to you, but I do want to highlight that payments for use of intangibles in combination with services is on the list. And, and this, is a, this is something that could be quite broad because possibly technology payments which involve a combination of 
software plus services could be caught within the SDTR. Uh, we do know that developing countries are pushing to have this list expanded. Uh, so we'll have to wait and watch to see uh, what the final rules contain and whether more payments are added to this list or not. The other important point to sort of reiterate when we are talking about STTR is that it only applies when these covered payments are made to related parties, so they're called connected parties. So third party payments are not affected by STTR at all. Now, let's talk of what happens uh, when STTR gets triggered and what happens when it is in fact uh, triggered. Now, as I mentioned earlier, STTR is a payment based rule and it applies when a payment made to a connected party in another jurisdiction is taxed in the recipient's jurisdiction at a rate below 9%. Uh, so for this, we are talking about the nominal rate that is applicable to those payments with certain adjustments and not the ETR on the net income. Uh, if the recipient's country adopts a lower, adopts a nominal rate that is lower than 9% under the STTR, uh, there can be a top-up withholding tax in the payer's country under the treaty. And we'll take an example of this, uh, a simplified example of this in the next slide. There are a handful of exclusions, but as you can see, they are not very broad-based. Certain low-margin payments are being discussed as being kept outside the scope of STTR, but we need to wait to see if this comes in the final rules or for that matter, what exactly will qualify as a low-return payment. But this is, again, an area for us to watch out for. Uh, the other thing for us to mention uh, is that STTR will be implemented through changes in the treaty network and developed countries which have these sort of low tax regimes on covered payments uh, will be required to incorporate the STTR in their tax treaties with developing countries like India. So in some sense, it's akin to the minimum standard that we saw under the 2016-17 MLI. Uh, in terms of timelines, the model rules for STTR were due last week, but it now looks like We'll have them only sometime early next year. Uh, there is a multilateral instrument that is expected uh, to be signed by mid-2022 in order to give effect to the STTR and implementation will start somewhere in 2023. This is obviously ambitious as many of the panelists noted and we'll have to wait and watch to see if these timelines are achieved. Now, let me just move to a very quick example of how STTR works. Now, here we have a very simple situation where an Indian entity is making payment and this payment is for use of equipment to a group entity in country X. Um, normally, assuming there were no STTR, we would look at the treaty between India and country X and assuming in this scenario that the treaty uh, definition of royalty is not including, does not include payments for use of equipment, uh, we would say that this is in the nature of business income which is not taxable in India unless there's a permanent establishment. And if there is no permanent establishment, there would be no withholding tax on the payment that India is making to Exco. Now, when STTR comes into the play, it will affect the situation in the following ways. So we'll, we'll have to undertake a series of steps to figure out how STTR gets triggered. And the first thing for us to see there would be to see if the payment that is being made is a covered payment or not. Now, in this case, the payment is for use of equipment, which is uh, covered payment, we saw that in the list earlier, so that's going to be covered. The second requirement is that the payment must be to a connected person and not a third party. This again is a condition that's satisfied in this fact pattern. Third, and this is where the calculation part begins, we look at the rate that is applicable to these payments in the country of receipt. And in this example, we even though the rate of tax, the normal corporate tax rate is 25%, we are assuming that there is a concessional rate of 5% that applies for leasing income. And because this concessional rate of 5% is lower than the 9% STTR threshold, the difference between 9 and 5, which is 4, that 4% 4 tax on the gross payment is the top up tax under STTR. And what that means is that when an entity is making a payment to Exco, instead of doing a no P, no tax, zero withholding as it would have done in the past, it would now have to deduct a tax at 4% on the gross payment that it makes to Exco. So that's an incremental cost that will have to be paid to the Indian government in a scenario like this. Uh, this obviously could have several implications from a paying perspective and we'll talk a bit more about that uh, later on. Uh, there are some areas within STTR which we still don't have enough clarity on. For instance, we are not clear what the threshold is going to be. Uh, it could be the 750 million threshold that we spoke of earlier. It could possibly be a lower threshold or it could be a threshold that operates completely differently. For instance, a threshold that's based on uh, 
uh, different criteria like what is the volume of related party covered payments that you make, etc. Uh, the other important thing for us to watch and wait uh, is to see if any additional payments get included in the list of covered payments and also how the exclusion for low return payments will work. Uh, at a practical level, uh, because of the increased complexity in the withholding process, this could add uh, a bit more difficulty in the withholding process for many Indian payers. Uh, and, and I think that's a point that I'll hand back over to Naveen to discuss with some of our panelists. Uh, thank you, Hari. And uh, let, let me open this now to Mr. Qureshi and Sanjeev in the context of uh, how this would apply to foreign headquartered groups. Uh, maybe uh, Mr. Qureshi, I'll come to you and, and maybe two parts to that question. First, really, is that uh, do you see some challenges coming up in, in application of this STTR? Uh, I mean, you already see challenges with definitions around various categories of, of payments like royalties and FTS. Uh, based on uh, while we still don't have more details and the rules are yet not out, uh, do you think the, the definitions could present some challenges uh, in terms of interpretation and could this be then become a hotbed of litigation going forward? And second is that, uh, you know, how big of an impact do you see vis-a-vis uh, -vis your internal processes as you make these related party payments? Because now you will have to apply a number of tests as you look at payments, uh, you know, from a withholding perspective. Uh, you already had to deal with uh, issues around uh, guard provisions and then with, uh, you know, BEPS1, you had the PPT coming in. And now you have a multi-layered process that may come in with the STTR. So, so how is it sort of looking at that playing out, uh, you know, gearing up your internal systems to deal with all of this? Yeah, so uh, I think uh, the first one, uh, I think the final list of services is going to be very important. And not only the list of services, I think, as you rightly pointed out, a real tight definition of some of those services. Uh, for example, we know that uh, royalty has been a constant source of litigation in India. We have different definitions under different treaties for royalty and FTS, and that has been a constant pain as far as uh, and between India uh, uh, industry and the uh, uh, tax administration, there has been a complete disconnect on that. And even courts have interpreted that very differently in different cases. So I think it will be very important. Maybe they will they will have to be. If the list of services is centrally defined by someone like OECD, maybe there should be some central guidance also on how things should be interpreted. And then maybe all the countries who are participating in this, they should also be obliged to follow that guidance. For example, on right now, we sometimes uh, uh, understand that the Indian government is not following OECD. We do not follow OECD. But at least going forward, if we are going to have such a centrally driven project, then maybe we should have central guidance, which really everyone should endeavor to follow. Uh, I think the other thing which I would like to make, so while we said the list of services is still sort of open, uh, and I think capital gains, there is no certainty whether it will get included or not. But I guess if capital gains does get included, obviously it will be a big event. Uh, because all the uh, treaties which India uh, renegotiated a couple of years back, Singapore, Mauritius, etc., where we have these grandfathering provisions. Uh, I think we'll really need to see what is the impact of those. I, I, I would think a lot of them will actually get watered down uh, if this STTR uh, really comes in. I mean, you might actually end up paying tax despite having the grandfathering. Uh, that is one aspect. The other aspect would be, for example, I don't know how uh, will there be a category for other services? How will that be defined? Uh, for example, uh, the IT and the BPO industry is a very thriving industry which India has. And we have to make sure that there is no unintended consequence uh, on that industry, which is really the largest employment generator. So we have to really make sure that this is done very tightly and we don't really sort of uh, have uh, unintended uh, costs and consequences for these kind of industries. Uh, to answer your second question on the internal processes, I, I think obviously it will be a very involved process, Naveen. I think uh, every foreign payment of any significant amount to an affiliate will require analysis for the attributes uh, of the foreign affiliate to whom the payment is being made. Maybe some declarations may also have to be taken 
because from a withholding perspective, ultimately the responsibility is of the Indian company. The Indian government will not pull up the foreign affiliate. Uh, so maybe for our, our own paperwork, we'll have to take some kind of declarations. And I guess we already take declarations for no PE, we already take declarations for MLI and everything. Uh, so I think this is just going to add to some of that paperwork and the time actually spent in making some of those payments. Uh, thank you, very uh, useful uh, inputs. Um, and, and Sanjeev, to your thoughts on this is also maybe add another dimension to that uh, question is around uh, with, whether you believe there could be some possible solutions around this uh, to ensure that you as tax heads have actual adequate information and data uh, on, on the rates and, and what kind of adjustments actually need to be made for uh, applicability of SDDR because it's all it's on the adjusted rate side. So anything that you would look for in terms of solutions or guidance. So, um, I mean, uh, I think this is a really complicated, uh, uh, going to be complicated exercise. Uh, we need to know, you know, consider a lot of factors as Mr. Qureshi already mentioned. Uh, so whether the payment is a covered payment or not, whether you no know, SDTR thresholds are met, uh, or, or you know, they part of the exclusions, whether it is uh, fitting into that uh, exclusion list. Uh, and and, and more, more, the most important thing is this tax is on the gross basis. So there is no uh, deductions or, you know, it's not on the net basis as the other uh, tax uh, in the globe rule is, uh, is, is applicable. So we have to be mindful that this, the implication of this tax is going to be huge. Uh, whether it is 2% or 4%, if it is happening on the overall transaction, it is going to hurt a lot. Uh, and, and, you know, it depends uh, on what sort of administrative mechanism are in place uh, to determine the actual rates. If the, you know, uh, companies have to have their own systems, uh, it, it will it will have a lot of efforts and, and, and cost on, of compliance because the companies have to take their own uh, interpretation at times and it will all again go into litigation. So better would be that, you know, either there is some authenticated government portal where all this information with respect to the, the tax rates applicable in other, other jurisdictions on certain payments are, are given. And, and of course, you know, we, we need to uh, deal with all these IT changes, et cetera, within the uh, company. So this is, all going to be a challenging thing uh, in, in the times to come. Thank, thank you, Sanjeev, and thank you, Mr. Qureshi. I mean, this is something where there's going to be a lot of pressure point uh, coming in from, from an Indian government perspective, and which is why probably you see that the STTR rules have been, are going to happen early part of next year, because I would believe that there's one avenue where India would be looking at to, to raise additional taxes, this would be one of those. But uh, you all are right that uh, there will be a heavy dependency on, on all of you as tax heads to make the right decisions. And therefore, having clarity on the scope, the coverage, the interpretational aspects, uh, given that this is now going to be blessed by the OECD. So therefore, there should be an alignment from that perspective as well, uh, as well as administrative rules to make sure that this does not exacerbate the problem that you're already dealing with in, uh, from a withholding tax perspective. So I think uh, an interesting watch point in, in the months ahead. So let, with that, maybe I hand it back to Hari. Hari, should we move to the next section on the on the globe rules and its impact to outbound structures? Sure. And, and we'll go over this uh, fairly quickly. Uh, so the second area where we mentioned that STTR will have, uh, where the pillar two rules will have an impact is on outbound structures of Indian headquartered groups. And for globe, uh, unlike STTR, where we looked at the nominal rate that applied to the payment, for the globe rules, we will look at the ETR. And the ETR that we are talking about here is not the normal ETR that you can calculate by, you know, looking at a financial statement with a calculator in your hand, but something that's far more sophisticated, far more detailed, and far more complex, with a variety of adjustments, with a variety of carve-outs that are provided in the law. We, we won't get into the details of all of that now, but there are several adjustments to be made, both to the numerator as well as to the denominator, to get to the ETR that is going to be used for the purposes of the GLOBE rules. The other important point here is that we, we're not going to be doing this ETR calculation at an entity level, but we will consolidate all the entities in a jurisdiction and do some sort of a jurisdictionally blended ETR rate for the purposes of the GLOBE rules. Uh, if the outcome of this ETR calculation throws up an ETR that is below the agreed rate of 15%, then the ultimate parent entities country can come in and collect a top-up tax. But we'll see a quick example as to how this will work. Uh, 
unlike the STTR, this will happen through uh, domestic law changes. Uh, it, it is expected that even though countries don't have to follow these rules, they don't they don't have the ability to stop other countries from uh, from levying a top up tax on the profits of companies that operate within their jurisdictions. Uh, there are uh, very limited exclusions, unlike uh, similar to STTR. The one additional exception here is for shipping income. Uh, and as I mentioned, the implementation will be through domestic law changes. I'll just quickly go over a very quick example. Uh, and if you if you see this structure, we have an Indian headquartered group with two subsidiaries, one in the UK and one in Luxembourg. Uh, for the sake of simplicity, we'll assume that uh, the UK company has an ETR calculated under the complex formula, which comes to 20%. And because that 20% number is higher than the 15% minimum tax rate, as far as UK is concerned, the globe rules don't apply and we are done. Now, as far as the other entity is concerned, Luxembourg, Let's take an assumption that the ETR of Luxembourg comes to 5%, which is below the 15% threshold. So what that means is that the difference between 15 and 5, which is 10%, the 10% 10, a 10 tax on the profits of the Luxembourg entity will be the top-up tax that India will get to collect first. Uh, if for whatever reason India chooses to not apply the IIR, then the right to collect that 10% tax on Luxembourg's income will shift to UK in this example, and UK will collect that money, collect that additional tax by disallowing a deduction for certain payments that are made by UK to Luxembourg. So the idea will be that the quantum of deduction will be such that will give UK the additional tax necessary to offset uh, what Luxembourg has chosen to not tax. Uh, the U this is the UTPR. It's a fairly complex uh, set of rules and it's expected that work on UTPR will continue until next year. So it's a combination of uh, rules allowing either India or another group entity to come in and tax income of low tax overseas subsidiaries. Uh, there are, like in the case of STTR, still some open areas. I mentioned that we, while we do have a 750 million threshold for the income inclusion rule, uh, a lower threshold is possible. So we'll have to wait and watch to see if India chooses a lower threshold. There are still details on the fine print. There are details about simplification, which is an important one, which are still awaited. Uh, because simplification could be quite tricky because the idea is that they don't want to unduly create burdens on companies which have to do uh, enormous amounts of calculations for a large number of countries in which they operate. So there are a fair, uh, there are multiple simplification options that are under consideration, which include use of CBCR, use of a single year data for multiple years, creating some sort of a safe list, etc., that may come in in the final rule. So we'll have to wait and watch uh, for that as well. Uh, so that really is all that I had on the uh, working of the IIR and the UTPR. I'll now hand it over back to Naveen for a discussion with the panelists on this. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Hari. And uh, maybe I'll open it up now for uh, Amit first. And Amit, uh, two set of questions for you. Uh, as as we saw, the list of exclusions uh, is quite narrow, and a company like yours operates in the infrastructure sector. Uh, traditionally, you would have structures where there are incentives in many countries. Uh, do you believe that this list of exclusion should have been more expansive? I believe that this list of, uh, and basically because its centers are often looked at by countries to attract more investment. So that's really my first part of the question. And the second question is really uh, that for groups like yours, which have subsidies across the world, uh, you know, it, it becomes important. The simplification measures becomes important because otherwise you would have to do ETR calculations across many jurisdictions, which would be quite cumbersome. So what would be some of your thoughts or some of your preferences as these uh, simplification options are being developed. No, you are right, Naveen. And historically, we have seen that tax has always been a tool of economic development in many countries. And, uh, you know, it has tax has always been uh, uh, given as a subsidy incentive for boosting the industry like infrastructure or pharmaceutical and all. And therefore, it is always a very important factor of any, any investment decision. For a company, you know, who are dealing with infrastructure or pharmaceutical or any other trust sector, and uh, what you said is right. The the exclusions given are are not fully covering the substance part of the business. So therefore, uh, you know, the expectation is that if if uh, if the industry has a substance in a particular jurisdiction, uh, there should be substantial exclusion given for that. Because ultimately, uh, you know, when you you are deploying your workforce. When you are deploying your tangible assets in a country and you are meeting the substance threshold, uh, you know, you should get a substantial exclusion in terms of the this minimum tax rate. 
coming to your second question on the computation of ETR, definitely uh, there is a lack of clarity and how the ETR, etc., will be computed. Uh, therefore, in my sense, if there could be some common portal uh, globally available where we can we can we can verify the ETR or uh, something like TRC, some kind of a certificate, if it is issued by a jurisdiction that the ETR of this company is coming out to be this, that would that would be useful from the compliance perspective. Okay, thank thank you, Amit and uh, Rahul. Over to you. I mean. Uh... Uh, once these rules are actually fully enforced, um, you know, what, what is your sense that, uh, you know, companies today may have, uh, you know, shifted uh, setting up their IP structures or supply chains and financing structures, uh, you know, set up overseas? Do you think some of that uh, will, will be curtailed to an extent? Uh, in any case, from an India perspective, the corporate tax rate was dropped to 25%, um, though it's still significantly higher than the 15% minimum rate. Do you still believe there's an opportunity for India to do a little bit more in terms of reducing its uh, tax rates, or should uh, should India be continue to do what it's doing uh, in terms of non-tax measures like the whole PLI incentives that are coming out? So, what's your thought on on what India should do to make this more attractive? Yeah, th uh, thanks, Tavin. So the way we understand this, uh, you know, artificial structures are already gone, like with the BAPS, uh, you know, initial initiative which had come in seven, eight, nine. And then initiative, but having said that, uh, you know, the way at times some technology industry works uh, and, uh, you know, some way at times they have to kind of work and operate in certain jurisdiction based on the, you know, non-tariff barriers, like certain countries say that you have to go to manufacture here to kind of tap the local market. And uh, in that case, even if uh, there are, you know, whatever tax structure out there, you have to, uh, you know, kind of do some kind of financing out there to, you know, set up your, you know, uh, the manufacturing facility and set up the R&D and stuff like that. So having said so, uh, you know, the, the IP decision is not going to be driven by tax, but for business consideration, which are, you know, largely market driven in terms of, uh, you know, the barriers the government across the world will create in terms of making the um, products locally in the uh, local jurisdiction. So that is uh, so, but having said it, I said earlier, it's still this global 15% tax rate vis-a-vis -vis the 25% tax rate of India. Still, there is going to be a pocket of opportunity wherever it comes for the, you know, large corporate or the global corporates, uh, so to say, operating from, say, jurisdictions like, uh, say, India or for maybe, uh, say, US, uh, which is looking at the tax rate of, uh, uh, say, 28% or so, or UK, for that matter, we hear them earlier, they were also kind of uh, racing towards the bottom. Now they had kind of changed their gear and kind of uh, moving to a tax rate, which is uh, somewhere around in mid-20s, uh, so to say. So having said so, uh, you know, while there may be some minor opportunity based on substance, obviously, but having said so, uh, you know, when it comes to the tax rate of India, so to say, this 25% tax rate is a pretty healthier and a competitive tax rate, so to say, considering the kind of locational advantage India gives for uh, people worldwide to manufacture India or to leverage uh, the infrastructure or the people or the skills uh, which are available in India. And it's very competitive cons considering the rates out there. But having said so, you know, to attract investment in manufacturing sector, India has also kind of given a window of 15% tax rate to set up. Uh, uh, so, so set up new manufacturing industry by 2023. I believe that window is going to be extended and wherein, you know, India will also going to have a 15% tax rate for new industries is going to be set up for time to come. And uh, yeah, this is what I feel. And uh, so this PLI and other opportunities, you know, all these keep coming to make India more attractive. So, so uh, the finger crossed and, uh, you know, having said that uh, India is going to be a good structure be it a holding structure or be it uh, you know any which way so i personally have the view the kind of tax structure india has with atm and other uh, you know neutralizing provisions so india is going to be a great uh, you know holding structure by itself in the time to come thank thank you uh, rahul and i think it, uh, you're ending it on a very optimistic note so once again thank you thank you to all my fellow panelists uh, for your valuable insights and an engaging session uh, i'd like to wrap up this session uh, suffice to say that the, all of you as tax heads in the Indian industry has a task cut out for themselves. One, of course, is to monitor all the developments which are happening at breakneck speed, uh, whether it's the rollout of the rules, the commentary, follow the changes that are happening at the local level, multilateral changes, model the impact areas for, for yourself and your organizations, prepare internal stakeholders for a range of potential implications. Uh, it, there's a whole lot coming your way. Uh, so I hope you're geared up for this. Uh, sort of a tsunami, if I would say, in the world of international tax. 
but with this we come to the end of the session and uh, with, i would like to now hand it back to the moderator to continue with the proceedings thank you everyone for joining today